was the only one. Physics became something related. Mainly, the National Institute, I would say, mainly. CAPS has stated such a task among its missions and duties. Here, we learn science, we explore science, we leave a legacy of science for our new generations. And here, like today, we host outstanding people who live down, who, who have down and contributed a lot of great science. This year, King Faisal International Prize for Science is celebrating one of the most searched topics in physics since ancient times, the state of matter. Specifically, qubits and topological insulations. And who can convert these two sophisticated subjects better than the winners of this year prize, Professor Daniel Laus and Professor Lawrence Morenka, who have spent many years trying to untangle these puzzles. There will be to, uh, there will be two talks by our guest, followed by receptions. And now, I would like to invite Dr. Hammond and Brayton to introduce our speakers. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. It's an honor for me to be introducing the winner of King Faisal's Prize and I would like to thank Katz for this honor. Uh, the first speaker today uh, is a small change in this in the schedule. Uh, <coughs> the schedule was uh, Professor Daniel Laws will be starting, then Professor Lawrence Morningham will be the second talk, but we have some change in it, so Professor Morningham will start the talk. So Professor Morningham from University of Würzburg has significantly contributed to the experimental field of spintronics. Uh, his work includes groundbreaking methods for creating and manipulating spun polarized charge carrier states in semiconductors with the potential to develop magnetic storage devices. Professor Munenkam has experimentally confirmed the quantum spin hole effect, which firms up the field of topological insulator and noble from quantum matter. Uh, one thing also, I've known personally that uh, the first experiment or the first demonstration of topological consolidator was done in his lab in Wurzburg, as far as I can tell, right? So that's really a, an honor for us to have him here. The title of the lecture is Topological Insulator and New State of Matter. Please. <laughs> So this is a talk about topological insulators. And actually, this was a pretty much a chance discovery. I'm a spintronics person, like Daniel Loss is. And in the course of spintronics, we started working with spin orbit coupled systems. And in doing all of that, we found that we stumbled upon something new. This was basically a new state of matter, which is these topological insulators. To, I will be trying to get a bit of the ideas across in the next 30 minutes or so. Uh, a little bit about the band structure of the hotel that I have to tell you because that's where everything comes from. Uh, and then I will be talking about two dimensional topological insulators. Uh, take it to three dimensions. And I'll talk a bit about topological superconductivity, which is kind of the hot thing at the moment. And if there's some left, I can talk about Dirac systems. But the gist is a bit that this whole field actually now is, is moving in very different directions from the original spintronics. We still do that. But it opened up a whole new branch. 
So this is a, uh, a plot that I that I <coughs> was given when I came to Würzburg in uh, 1999. Uh, Würzburg has many MBEs for growing semiconductor heterostructures. And <coughs> in order to help me to keep track of what we could grow, they gave me this, this graph here. What you see is basically all kinds of zinc blended semiconductors. This is their lattice constant and this is the band gap. And so they all have the same crystal structure, but of course because some atoms are bigger than other atoms, they all have a different lattice constant. And you see they, they group up in, 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 uh, in columns here, and these columns are the materials where you have the same lattice constant. So these guys you can easily grow on top of each other here. And so this is what I needed to know. This is the band gap of the materials, and basically you can see that if the lattice constant is larger, you have less interaction, so the band gap is smaller. Now, <coughs> the main suspect of this talk is, is Mercury tellurite, and what you see here is that Mercury tellurite indeed has a, a small band gap that you would expect for the large lattice constant because it has big atoms, but it actually has a negative band gap. You grow heterostructures with cadmium tellurite, which is way more normal, it has a, a normal band gap. And actually this negative band gap is where all this topology <coughs> comes from. If you look at this uh, band structure plot, which is a very ancient calculation of 1972, uh, you see here the band structure of mercury tellurite. And for those of you who are into semiconductors, uh, things look pretty familiar. It's a bit, it's, it's a lot like other zinc blender or cubic materials. So you have the heavy hole, light hole duplet, which has a gamma eight symmetry and the gamma seven spin orbit band. These are the, normally the, the valence band state in your zinc blender semiconductor. The weird thing is this guy here, gamma six. Gamma six usually is the conduction band and it comes from unoccupied S orbitals of the metal. And so there's something weird going on here, and the reason is that the metal in tellurite is mercury. Mercury is very heavy, and that means that these outer S electrons move very, very fast. And that gives the, <coughs> the absolute energy of these electrons a relativistic correction, and it's, it's over an EV in this case, which lowers the gamma-6 energy to be below gamma-8 now. And so this gives you a, what's called an inverted band structure, uh, and the negative gap simply is because the gap is defined as the difference between gamma 6 and gamma 8. So what we know now is that this inversion is the thing that's driving material to be topological. So if you have an inversion between S and P-like states like we have here at an odd number of high symmetry points in the BON zone, your material is topological. Well, there's a little but here. If you count states in this, this simple band structure of bulk mac tellurite you can see that actually the Fermi level is at the gamma A duplet, which means that this is a semi-metal and not a semiconductor. So if you want to do transport physics and no, uh, have no bulk uh, conductance, you have to open up a gap between the heavy hole and the light hole state. And so <coughs> this is how we started out. I mean, the, the easiest way to do it is to grow a quantum well. Hey, you may know in quantum wells, you sandwich mercury tellurite here with mercury cadmium tellurite, and you see that actually the quantum well looks a bit weird. Hey? It, it, it's this overlapping thing here. Um, it's this overlapping thing here. But um, it's called a type 3 quantum well. You see also that the merc tellurite here, merc cadmium tellurite barrier has a normal band structure. Now, <coughs> if you have a white quantum well, confinement energy is small. And that means that the state, that the heavy hole state, which is this, this H state here, and also the, the light hole state, which is here, uh, but the heavy hole state is higher in energy than the state coming from gamma 6, which is electron-like, which is why we call it an E state. And so these, inver these, these, these white quantum wells with very small confinement energy still are inverted. But if you now narrow down your quantum well and you add confinement energy, basically what you do is you push down the H state and you push up the E state. And there's a critical thickness where these guys overlap. And then um, for narrow quantum wells, the E state is above the H state, and you have a normal band structure again. And so basically, by tuning the width of your quantum well, you can tune material from being topological uh, to normal. And that already gets us into this, this first effect that we uh, looked at to see uh, these topological interrelated things. And this is where it all comes from. It comes from a generalization of the quantum Hall effect. And it's a, it's a pretty abstract uh, generalization which came to, to topology. 
and basically the way you look at insulators. Uh, in the 50s, insulators for physicists were kind of this. You had a uh, filled valence band. You had a <coughs> empty conduction band. Um, and basically, uh, in the bulk, you have electrons going around the cores. But there's not much happening. And if the Fermi level is in the gap, there's no conduction. That's an insulator. But then in the 80s, all of a sudden, a very new type of insulator was discovered. It was a very weird one. It, it's, it's, it's the quantum Hall effect. Uh, basically, you know that a quantum Hall effect is something you see in a two-dimensional electron gas at very high magnetic fields. <coughs> and <coughs> actually, you wouldn't really look at that as an insulator. But of course, what you get in the quantum Hall effect, if you have a perpendicular, perpendicular magnetic field, you get that the electrons take these cy cycloton orbits and the area of these orbits is, is quantized. Eh? And this has to do with lambda level quantization. And now you can look at your band structure again as basically a number of filled lambda levels and a number of empty ones above it. And so the utmost filled ones is, called, is now the valence band, and the lowest empty one is a conduction band. And now the big different thing in the quantum Hall effect is that, well, in the bulk, the quantum Hall effect actually creates an insulator. But at the edges of your material, the electrons make this, this, these skipping orbits, which are now known as edge states. And these edge states actually can conduct electricity. And so beca uh, because of that, if you now adjust the Fermi energy in the gap, you will hit the dispersion of one of these edge states, and you have a conductor. Now, you can understand this at very many levels. Um, but if you want to generalize this to uh, situations at, at, at zero magnetic field, uh, one thing that, that was uh, very important is a calculation by, by Taules, who showed that actually you can show that this type of insulator is different from, from this type by a new type of quantum number, a topology qu topological quantum number. He applied topology in quantum field theory to these systems. Yeah, it's called a churn number. And <coughs> if the churn number is, is unequal zero, you have a quantum hole insulator. Um, this was end 80s. Um, and people looked at this for a long time, trying to generalize uh, the quantum Hall effect. Uh, but it was only until 2005, 2006, these references here, that Charlie Kane and Eugene Malley actually showed that, yes, you can also define a new type of topological quantum number in certain condensed matter systems. It's a Z2 topological quantum number, meaning it can be zero or one. Most materials are zero, but if your material is one, you have edge channels again, but now it's zero magnetic field, and these edge channels will be spin polarized. So one spin will go in one direction, the other spin in the other direction. That's the quantum spin Hall effect. Only problem was that at that time, uh, when they made the first statement about the Z2 topological invariant, they didn't really know what the exact thing in the band structure should be. And they already uh, gave away that actually the inversion in the band structure is what's driving this invariant. And just to show a little bit of what's going on, I can show you this graph here. Uh, basically, this is a, a trivial insulator. Uh, looking on top of the mesa, this is the conduction band, this is the valence band. And the conduction band, of course, will have electrons in it. Uh, but these electrons remain in the material. And that means that outside of the material, there has to be some band bending that keeps electrons inside. And uh, this is electron affinity or whatever. Um, so you have band bending upwards here. And the same thing is in the valence band, of course, the carriers here are, are holes. And, and now, uh, if you actually exit this, this mesa, the band will have to bend downward to keep the holes in. But look now at what happens if I do the same thing with um, an inverted material. Uh, in this normal material, if the Fermi energy is in the gap, well, I don't hit any dispersion, so I have no conductance. But now, in my quantum spin hall material, just my inverted semiconductor, basically I have a conduction band that at the outer side uh, realizes that in the topology of the outside world, it is a valence band and it has to bend downward. Just so like this here. And the valence band realizes it's a conduction band and bends upwards. So if I now adjust the Fermi energy in the middle of the gap, yeah, you see that, that I cross these dispersions now meaning that I can have charge transport at the edges of my material. And now you add in that these materials all have strong spin-orbit coupling, and that means that, that I have these 
spin down electron going in one direction, spin up electrons the other direction. This is the quantum spin Hall effect. So that's why <coughs> this, this inversion of the band structure is actually what brings about this difference in topology between the materials. Now, a first very simple experiment to, to look at this is, is, is shown here. Uh, this is the uh, <coughs> conductance measurement on a, a hole bar, yeah, so it has these six probes here. You bias, you push a current from here, you ground here, and you look at the longitudinal uh, uh, conductance. Now, if you have your normal insulator, these S channels are not there when the Fermi level is in the bulk. So uh, if you scan your Fermi level through the gap, of course, the conductance is zero in the gap. But if I have now this, this inverted material with S channel conductance, I have one spin up channel going from left to right and one spin down channel going from left to right. That means that my conductance is quantized in 2 d squared over H. And that's where the whole thing started. We had this milk telluride. Uh, we made nanostructures out of it. And lo and behold, we saw that the conductance in the material is quantized very close to 2 d squared over H. Now this is 2007. This basically started this topology field well, there's lots of things to do in terms of lithography. I mean, you can see already here that we couldn't scan very far in the beginning. We could scan a bit further a few months later, simply tweaking your lithography. And we're still working on these type of things. We now make our uh, sample edges by wet etching, so we're going back to old-fashioned techniques. But we get way uh, sturdier quantum Hall effect. Now, this was two dimensions. Um, but you can easily generalize this now to three dimensions. Yeah, the quantum Hall effect is difficult to generalize in three dimensions because you need a third dimension for the uh, magnetic field. But if you have an inverted band structure, you can easily imagine that you also do so. Can you, you can have a similar effect to these edge channels if you go to a three-dimensional uh, system with inversion, band inversion, you would have two-dimensional surface states that carry the conductance. Actually, these surface states have Dirac dispersion. And this is what you see here. Uh, again, this is the band structure of bulk mercury telluride. And what you see here is this surface state, this topological surface state on top of the material. These are two DFT calculations. This is an actual experiment which was done by colleagues at, at Stanford University. Now, this is still in this bulk material where I have this semi metallic band structure of the gamma H touching each other. What you can do actually now is, is play with your band structure. And we do so. By, by straining our layers. This is called band structure engineering. And well, one easy thing to do is actually grow on, on cadmium telluride substrates because the lattice constant is 0.4% larger than of mercury telluride. Now, if you have this tensile strain, basically what you see here is you open up a gap. You simply pull these, these two gamma-8 bands apart. And uh, this is just to show that we can grow these layers in a strained fashion. Uh, the band structure is a bit complicated here. This is a 17 nanometer layer. So you have um, confinement states which you don't really resolve. But this is the surface state. It uh, still mixes in with bulk states. But in the end, you can show that there will be um, conductance to the surface state when the Fermi level is in the gap. And that's what we saw very early on. Uh, so this is a very simple structure ungated, just a piece of growth material basically, which we made into a hole bar. We put it in a magnetic field and we directly saw a, a quantum Hall effect from this thick 70 nanometer thick sample. And if you see a quantum Hall effect, you, can only exp you know it has to come from two dimensional electron systems. It cannot come from bulk, from 3D. And so this means that actually the quantum Hall effect you see here has to come from the top and bottom surface state of these materials. Well, to <coughs> check this a bit further, we actually put a gate on. And now you see as a function of gate voltage, you see uh, a whole range of, of, of quantum Hall traces. And to make some sense of it, in the next plot, I will show you uh, gate voltage versus B. But now I will plot as, as circles the transitions between these quantum Hall plateaus. And what you see here is that these quantum Hall plateaus, uh, or these transitions, neatly line up in two Landau fans. Uh, basically directly reflecting the fact that you see the top and the bottom surface state in this transport experiment. Well, we also can take this further. We now make these, these bulk samples. Actually, um, we add some capping, which, which actually increases the mobility. It's not necessary to have the surface state, but the mobility goes up by a factor of 10. And so now we can very easily actually <coughs> see our surface state both 
n-type and p-type, and this was previously impossible. And what you also see here in this, this gate scanner zero field is that actually the Dirac points of top and bottom surface state pass through the Fermi level at different gate voltages. This is also something that we expect from our electrostatics deliberations. Okay, well the big thing now is actually superconductivity or topological superconductivity, which we achieve actually by inducing superconductivity in these TIs by working with superconducting contacts. And the thing you hope to see is something like Majorana bound states, which is one of the important things for, or possibilities for quantum computing. Well, for now we're just interested in the superconductivity, and, and what we do is some, first some very simple experiments. We place niobium contacts on top of a mesa, first of this three-dimensional murky telluride, which is simple. Uh, we don't have to add to any layers. And we directly see uh, in our IV curve that we have a very strong supercurrent in this material. Now that was quite nice because we've been trying to induce superconductivity in three phi's for a long time. That's very hard because of Schottky barriers. Two sixes don't have Schottky barriers and actually you get a very decent superconductivity. Another thing that you notice if you look at this IV curve is that actually uh, if you extrapolate uh, the, the, high uh, the high current behavior to low current you see that there's an excess current that we observe in this, this IV characteristics and that's the sign that we have Andreev bound states acting in the transport in these materials. And this is something, well, the first thing you need to get these Majorana bound states. There's another thing that we see some inflection points uh, at, at, at twice the gap and at the gap. And the fact that we see something at the gap already is an indication. We have this, this zero energy state there, a state which is both electron and, and hole like present in these samples. But you'd like to have some more evidence. Well, the, the Fraunhofer pattern, which is the, uh, the super, uh, magnitude of your supercurrent as a function of perpendicular magnetic field, doesn't show very much interesting information. So we went to uh, high frequency experiments uh, where we basically used the fact that this mode at zero energy, uh, which is the blue line here, actually uh, has a different dependence, it differs by a factor of two in the dependence on the phase between your superconducting contacts. Uh, so these are the normal Andreev bound states, the red ones here, and you see that the zero mode, the so-called zero mode, actually has a uh, uh, the double uh, uh, phase dependence compared to the normal modes. And what we do here is a, an experiment which uh, actually is quite in concept pretty complicated, but experiment is very simple. So we irradiate our Josephson junction uh, with RF. And if the RF frequency now is of the same order as your Josephson frequency, uh, you get a plateau in the current outside the supercurrent region. It's called Shapiro steps. And what these people here now suggested is that simply because this guy has a different Josephson frequency than the red guys, you will see steps starting to miss in your Shapiro's response. And of course, the steps that should be missing are the odd steps, because the other ones are still present at the frequency of these guys here. And, and so this is the first experiment we did. This is this three-dimensional sample. And what you see here is that if you go to, uh, so this is the supercurrent regime. And now if you take it, the sample out of superconductivity, you see these steps in the voltage uh, <coughs> Uh, current relationship. And you see these, these, are, these are the Josephson frequencies that are plotted here. And you see if the RF frequency is high, you simply see all steps. But if you go to lower and lower frequencies, and we understand why this is, you see the first step is missing. And that's already a very strong sign that we have this zero mode present in these three-dimensional junctions. It's not very strongly there because it's, well, it's, there is a zero mode, but there's many other modes. And things should be a lot better if you go to two-dimensional junctions. That's the next thing we did. This is in lithography a lot more difficult because now you have your quantum well. And so you have to, to dig a hole in your barrier to make a super contact to your quantum well. And we also managed to get a gate in there. But, but it was a lot of work, but the results were very impressive. So what you see here is that if we do Shapiro steps experiments now, you see steps missing not only at n equal 1, but at 1 and 3, 1, 3, 5, 1, 3, 7, 5, 7, up to n equal 9. So this is really the prediction 
of these theorists of a couple of years ago, directly vindicated in this experiment here, we see very strong evidence for the presence of this zero mode and exotic superconductivity in these materials. And the final experiment we do there is, is now actually a somewhat simpler experiment to understand, but difficult to do. We look at the Josephson mission. And so basically you bias your Josephson junction out of uh, superconductivity, and you look at the noise that comes from it, and you have to hope to pick up the, the Josephson frequency. And of course, the Josephson frequency uh, for the zero mode has half the frequency uh, compared to uh, all the normal modes. And we do a pretty simple experiment again. So we, we bias all in DC, and we have a bias T to take out the AC for the specialist, and we amplify it, and stick the noise in a, in a, in a spectrum analyzer. And what we really see there is, is this experiment here, where in topological quantum wells, so that's the, uh, the wider wells, we really see very dominantly uh, emission at, at half the Josephson frequency, what we expect for this Majorana mode. And if we have this trivial quantum well, a narrow one, which is a test sample or a, um, a way to make sure that we measure the right thing, uh, we only see the fundamental Josephson frequency. So this is a very uh, straightforward to interpret experiment. The only way you can interpret this is that you have this zero mode present in your sample. Well, this is basically showing that it's uh, not always there. Oops. That is not always there, not only there, if the gate voltage is in a quantum spin hall regime. We also see emission from the zero mode when the Fermi level is in the bands. And we think we can understand that this is occurring because uh, these, these edge modes have different k vector than the bulk modes. So these edge modes do not mix very strongly. And they are actually predominantly strong in carrying the superconductivity. OK, the last few minutes of the talk um, is a bit more about strain engineering. Uh, this is something work we've been doing recently. Um, I already showed you that by growing on cadmium telluride, we can do tensile strain. Um, compressive strain would be nice, but it's very more difficult because there are no substrates available to, to do so. So what we do actually is we take a gallium mass that substrate, which has a lattice constant that's way off. And now we grow a super lattice on this of cadmium zinc telluride, cadmium telluride. And this takes all kinds of tricks to do correctly. Uh, <coughs> but we are able to actually accommodate all the strain between the super lattice and the gallium arsenide substrate in the first layers of, of cadmium telluride. And then by actually varying the, the periodicity of this super lattice, we can now tune the, the strain that we have in our epi layer from the tensile strain already showed you to a very strong compressive strain. Now, why are we interested in compressive strain? Well, basically, if you go to compressive strain, uh, <coughs> you now do the opposite of what we did with the tensile strain. With the tensile strain, we pull the gamma eight bands apart, the light and the heavy hole. And with the compressive strain, you pull them through each other. So what you get now is, is two Dirac points. And actually, these are wild points uh, because of inversion symmetry in the lattice uh, in our band structure. And it turned out that this is a very nice demonstration of a Dirac slash wild system. Uh, what you see here is, is um, the telltale signal for the wild material. You see a very strong negative magneto resistance when, the, uh, <coughs> when we have a magnetic field in plane uh, in the direction of the current. It's called a chiral anomaly. It's again something from quantum field theory, from particle physics. And it's something that you can simply see in these samples. And the nice thing about these samples is, of course, that we can gate them very nicely. And this is, uh, zero field gate sweep. So we really see that the, the Dirac points, we can directly define these in our material. Uh, and you can also show that actually this, 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 this negative magneto resistance, this, this chiral anomaly, only shows up when the Fermi level is really at the Dirac point. What we're doing now, of course, is inducing superconductivity in these systems because you expect very interesting superconducting pairing uh, from these uh, Dirac points in your band structure. OK, that's all I wanted to show you. So mercury telluride is an ancient semiconductor, actually. It's used for, for night vision applications uh, very widely. widely. Uh, but we've shown it's a two- and a three-dimensional topological insulator. Um, you can really do very nice transport experiments on it. And we're now very excited about the superconducting pro proximity that we can observe. This is also topological. 
and we can make these vial systems work in this material. Thank you for your attention. Well, you need to find uh, inversion, and there is in the 3.5 there is this uh, combination of indium arsenide, gallium and timonite, which actually you can tweak in such a way that you also have an inverted band structure there. So there it also works. Uh, this is a two-dimensional system. Um, there is other families of materials that, that show these effects. And of course in three dimensions the bismuth selenide, bismuth tellurite family is also very famous. It's also easy to grow, so much of the the surface work on, on 3 DTIs is done in this business satellite family. Other Now it should work. I think it should work now. Yeah. I think it's on the side. Okay, but then so you have a stick.
Yes, uh -huh, that could be mine. Huh? Let's see. Ah, okay. I think the display is not working. I'm sorry. So where should I put it? Here? Yeah. Oh, okay, good. Uh, so I apologize for this delay. And it has to do with the fact that this is a very modern computer. <laughs> it's the latest uh, Apple model. And you see that uh, sometimes it's not good to be actually at the edge of uh, modern technology. And this talk will be about that, even the next generation. And you can imagine that we will have even more problems uh, than what I just uh, demonstrated. Okay, so first I would like to thank, uh, of course, uh, you know, the organizers to give me the opportunity here with some delay uh, to present uh, uh, some of uh, our work. And the topic of my talk is uh, giving you a uh, introduction, overview of quantum computing, in particular based on uh, spintronics or spin qubits. The outline of my talk is long, 
Uh, I have a few topics and I will not go through this now, but uh, basically I would like to give you an idea what quantum computing is about and uh, you know, assuming that there are a few experts in there, uh, I will dig then maybe a little bit deeper at some points and you can also ask me questions uh, during the talk or after the talk. Good, let's uh, start uh, with the past. The past uh, you know, is based on uh, uh, transport of information in a uh, carriage way as it uh, used to be in the Western uh, uh, hemisphere. Uh, probably here very similar instead of horses probably used also camels but uh, that's uh, where we started from. And the uh, revolution which we had then in modern times and uh, still are thriving on that is uh, using electronics. Electronics like we have it in any uh, a gadget these days, uh, iPhone, uh, satellite, uh, transmission, computers, even cars now, they are purely electronic uh, uh, devices. And the question is, is there a step further, a revolution further we can go from here? And the uh, answer to that is yes, if we can move really to the quantum world. Quantum world means that we can control the coherence of matter. And uh, that basically is what quantum computing is about. Quantum computer wants to use the uh, uh, basic laws of quantum mechanics uh, and this is uh, to use quantum coherence and uh, that will lead to the next uh, revolution. We are not there yet, so these are things we are basically dreaming and hypothesizing uh, uh, about, but uh, I will give you now a little bit of a uh, taste where we stand these days. So quantum computing stands for many things and uh, it has many different meanings for different people and uh, at the basic level there is a lot of new physics of course in there because you would like to have the quantum coherence which we know from atoms uh, at the very small scale we would like to have this at the bigger scale we are not talking then quantum coherence of a few items we are talking about quantum coherence of millions of billions of items that they coherently interact with each other. And that's a very, very different state of matter and that's something uh, which uh, interests uh, and captivates the uh, fascination of many theorists and experimentalists. But it also stands for new technologies. Uh, here is a list of a few of them. Quantum communication, absolutely secure transmission of information is one part of it. Then the simulation of systems uh, could be done with a quantum computer. Quantum sensing, uh, to have very high sensitivity because you can use the quantum coherence is a very important part of it. Metrology, uh, how to uh, define units of measurement very precisely. And the ultimate goal in this uh, field of course is to build a quantum computer. Quantum computing has also uh, impacts on our logical uh, perception or thinking because information uh, basically must be uh, connected to a substrate. If the substrate is of course physics has to uh, obey the laws of quantum mechanics then one can even actually question whether there is an independent uh, logical proof that uh, does not uh, depend on the substrate and uh, basically making also mathematics a probabilistic uh, endeavor. And uh, some people even have started to think about the quantum mind and quantum biology that the quantum supposition in our process of brain uh, uh, might actually play a role. I will not say much about this. But here let me just mention uh, the field has uh, gone through many ups and downs and uh, now we basically see a second quantum revolution all over the world and uh, just mention here that in Europe now uh, from next or two years on we will have a huge uh, quantum flagship where exactly these uh, topics I listed here will be the central theme. It's just to say that uh, you know there's a lot of uh, excitement in the field all over the place. <coughs> now there are a few front runners <coughs> which are based on uh, physical substrates where quantum computing is uh, uh, being uh, pursued and pushed forward. So I will uh, talk about uh, our proposal here, spin qubits mostly, but I should also mention the superconducting devices uh, which are very well advanced. They are trapped ions uh, where people uh, 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 perform a lot of experiments and studies. And the new uh, kind of idea uh, on, the, on the block here is topological quantum computing. Lawrence has already alluded a little bit uh, on that. Uh, basically, Majorana fermions play a very important role here. Now, uh, summarizing a little bit the pros and cons of these systems is that the spin qubits and semiconductors are very small, they're very fast. And this is uh, why this system is considered to be one of the uh, 
uh, most important front runners, especially from industry like Intel and other chip uh, manufacturers. Superconducting devices, they are currently more advanced experimentally, but unfortunately they are not so small. They are about a thousand times bigger than a spin qubit or a quantum dot, and they are actually not very uh, fast. <coughs> the same for trapped ions. Quantum computing, there we don't even yet completely know whether we have a qubit at hand, let alone the phase coherence of a qubit. But these two systems, uh, they are in the basic, in the same uh, substrate, semiconducting nanostructures, and that's why many of the things now come a little bit together here uh, in this field that the uh, spintronics and uh, topology also meets here uh, in this uh, area. Now, let me give you a brief introduction to quantum computing. You can imagine that uh, has exploded now as a field by its own, and it's not so easy uh, to convey the basic ideas. Uh, so I try here. And uh, let me start with the basic unit in uh, computing, that's a bit. A bit is a zero or a one. And uh, you can either have zero or one. Quantum computing wants to extend that. It wants to have a zero and a one simultaneously in a superposition. And that's what is uh, uh, called a quantum bit or now a qubit. And that can be any state of a quantum two-level system. <coughs> and uh, in quantum mechanics, uh, I write this down in this way. The natural candidate for this is the spin of an electron, which can either point up or down, and uh, possibly have a coherent superposition between these two states. Then quantum computation is, let's say, take n such spins, prepare them all in the up state, and then you do some operation, which we call a unitary operation on that object, and that is uh, the calculation or the computation. In the end, you measure the output. And that's the end of it. Three steps they sound very easy. However, the most complicated one is the unitary transformation because that cannot be applied in one go because that would mean that we need n body forces. In nature, we only know two body forces. We only know how to interact two body at a time. And this makes the thing very complicated. Uh, unfortunately, it's known that any uh, n-body unitary transformation can be composed of two body ones, but it can be a very, very complicated sequence of that. And that is why quantum computing in the end uh, becomes a very uh, complicated task. Now there are things which can be done faster with a quantum computer. The most uh, famous one is the Shor algorithm. And uh, I was very pleased when I got informed about receiving this prize because Peter Shor received actually the King Faisal Prize uh, for this uh, invention many years ago. <coughs> and uh, it was a very good choice because uh, this was one of the most important contributions to the field to date. And uh, there are other... Uh, 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 speed ups which can be achieved, the Grover algorithm, the sorting al algorithm and so forth. Now there's an entire growing list now what people think can be done better and faster with a quantum computer and uh, it goes in all areas of uh, science and biology, climate, because you have to uh, abilities to search. Uh, it's only for, and also for energy to find uh, better photosynthesis processes which could be simulated by a quantum computer and so forth. <coughs> and there are many unforeseen applications uh, of course, which we hope uh, to see one day. Now, as I mentioned, <coughs> we need a quantum two-level system. Natural candidate is an electron spin. And an electron spin here, just to remind you, has two properties. One is the charge, the electron charge, and that is the strongest uh, tool which we have to move an electron. We apply electric fields, we apply magnetic fields. Lawrence has this uh, shown very nicely in his talk. If you apply magnetic field, then the charge leads to some cycloton motion, and you can move your electrons. But the electron has more. The electron has a spin, and that's also very important in uh, spintronics, and this is a magnetic moment. And we want to use this spin, this magnetic moment, as the carrier of information. Now, this sounds very easy. However, it's very difficult if you have a single electron and a single magnetic moment, because this magnetic moment is very, very small. It's one Bohr magneton, as we call it, and uh, you would need uh, very large magnetic fields and fast magnetic field switching in order to control this spin. And, uh, okay, so we have a zero and a one, and what you would like to end up is a coherent superposition uh, of these two, but this coherent superposition has uh, typically a very short lifetime. This is what we call a coherence time, and uh, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, it started out at uh, one nanosecond in some systems, gallium arsenide semiconductors. These days, in the same system, 
has been uh, pushed up by a factor of a million, which is really very amazing. If that shows you, we have kind of a Moore's law also here in the development of this field and going up to milliseconds. Now, the question is how to manipulate and measure a single electron spin. I mean, that's a uh, elementary particle and uh, that's not uh, completely obvious. And uh, the answer to that is uh, using uh, the charge and the electric field and manipulate the spin by that. And how can you do that? And this is uh, basically the topic of spin electronics or spintronics, uh, which exploits then spin orbit interaction or Pauli exclusion principle such that you get access uh, to the spin via the charge. And this is uh, what we have uh, proposed many years ago. Uh, my uh, colleague and friend, David DiVincenzo, uh, basically uh, thinking of uh, confining an electron in a quantum dot. The quantum dot is an artificial atom, let's say in a semiconductor matrix, a thousand times bigger than a natural atom typically, and uh, trapping an electron uh, at that time was not possible yet. Uh, it was kind of a prediction these days. Uh, there are many, many labs now which can do that and uh, you can trap a single electron in a quantum dot and you have a second quantum dot nearby and what you want to achieve now is this complete control over the spin. So for example, <coughs> you can do the spin readout measuring whether a spin is up or down just by moving the electron from one quantum dot to another quantum dot whereby you have a spin filter. That means only the spin up can go through but not the spin down. And then you uh, measure a charge on this side or you don't. And that's how you can trans uh, form the uh, information of spin into a charge information. There are many variations on that theme, but that's basically uh, the, uh, the main uh, uh, thrust now, uh, how experimentally these things are measured. <coughs> a second uh, uh, tool which we need is we need to have these two body forces, which I mentioned in the beginning. You need to have the two spins interact with each other such that they go into a so-called entangled state. I will show this a little bit more in detail, but uh, this you can do by electrically controlling the barrier between these two quantum dots, also electrically. And then the spins interact with each other. You can do spin rotation uh, by bringing an electron close, let's say, to a ferromagnet with exchange interaction, and, and also you can control this electrically. And this is a uh, all electrical spin control uh, system where the information is uh, uh, hidden in the magnetic moment, but the control is done by electric means. And that means you can do it locally and you can do it fast. <coughs> And uh, this uh, is some algebra you can then show that uh, you can get the fundamental gate, the so-called uh, XOR gate, uh, exclusive OR gate, by an application of a sequence of, uh, we call this now square root of swap, single spin rotation, square root of swap, and single spin rotation here. Square root of swap is essentially this uh, coupling between the spins. And uh, this paper now uh, is still uh, basically drawing the uh, roadmap of the field and uh, uh, increasing citations I just mentioned this year. Now a little bit more on a schematic uh, scheme here uh, closer to an experimental realization is a setup like this so it's a two-dimensional electron gas very similar material as uh, Lawrence uh, showed in his talk and uh, the yellow uh, stuff here are the gates uh, by which I can find now an electron, let's say here on this quantum dot and another one on this quantum dot, the left one and the right one, the spin. And uh, I want to end up with a Hamiltonian, now it's getting a little bit more technical, where I couple the spin on the left with the spin on the right. And uh, I want to have a control over the coupling between these two spins and that's basically given by this gate here. So how does this come about? This is fundamental physics. Uh, maybe you know from chemistry, if you take two hydrogen atoms and bring them close to each other, they try to find a new ground state, they share the electron, they go into a hydrogen molecule, and in this ground state, the two electrons find a new state, which is called a singlet state. And we, uh, that's very similar here. Uh, so we have this double weld potential, we can raise and lower this barrier here in between and overlapping of the wave function of the electron on the left hand side with the right hand side leads then to an energy splitting and in the ground state we can only have a spin up and a spin down because of Pauli exclusion principle. And this is the strongest force which we get between the spins and the excited state is the so-called singlet state where the two spins have to be up. And so just by electrical means, I can control now the spin state of my system and essentially uh, can control then what I call this J, this exchange as a function of this barrier tuning here up and down. 
I can also do uh, just biasing, pull this down, then I also control this exchange here. Now, uh, this is kind of nice, but uh, the problem, as I mentioned before, is how long can actually a state stay in such a coherent superposition? And that's the biggest challenge. Unfortunately, not very long, and this is uh, why we still don't have a quantum computer. Uh, the coherence is lost, so here is kind of a sketch of a superposition of up and down, and decoherence means you, you go either into the up or into the down. And uh, it's no longer a superposition. And the time scale on which this happens is uh, called a decoherence time, typically called a T2 time, which uh, 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 describes an exponential decay. There might also be other decays. It's a very, very complex uh, 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 process. And, uh, there are literally thousands of papers uh, where people have tried to understand how this decay process is due to the interaction with the material. And there are many material uh, contributions here which one has to take into account. The goal in the end is to have this T2 time, as we call it, the decoherence time, as long as possible. And uh, compared essentially to the switching time, how fast can I uh, create the state? That's the switching time, the gate time, or the clock speed of your processor. And that has about uh, 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 to be a factor of 1,000 faster, this uh, switching, than this the decay of the coherence. So <coughs> here I listed, uh, I will not go through all of them, but uh, there are many sources which cause uh, decoherence of a spin qubit. Uh, one of the most important ones is the interaction between the spin and the orbital motion. Uh, and that uh, in uh, uh, semiconductor has uh, two sources. One is called the uh, rush bus spin orbit interaction, which is produced essentially by electric fields due to confinement uh, of the quantum dots, the gates which I showed, and the intrinsic just by the material Dressel house spin orbit interaction. And as soon as you have this coupling between uh, spin and orbit, it's a relativistic effect, but uh, it gets strongly enhanced in the semiconductor, then you get also a coupling to lattice vibrations, to phonons. And uh, the phonons, they shake my charge, and because the charge is uh, connected to the spin, they also uh, shake the spin. And that's something which we uh, like to uh, keep as uh, small as possible. And here, it was very important in the development to understand actually what the sources are, what the geometry is in order to minimize the sources, and uh, what the best material is to have this kind of effect small. There is another source uh, in some materials which is very important, and that's the nuclear spin environment. I showed you this quantum dot. This quantum dot sits not alone. There are millions of uh, other atoms around, and they all, in gallium arsenide, have nuclear spins, spins on their own. And uh, typically, one electron spin is surrounded by a million or 10 million nuclear spins and interacts now with those nuclear spins. And those nuclear spins, they just destroy the phase coherence quickly, typically on a scale of a few nanoseconds. And that was considered in the beginning basically uh, making this material impossible to use. However, uh, theoretical understanding showed that one can regain the uh, phase coherence by clever uh, uh, processes, which is called the uh, spin echo techniques and uh, some other protocols, and uh, that allowed them to prolong those times by a factor of a million these days. Now, the entanglement uh, is a very important aspect uh, I was uh, a little bit amused uh, in the beginning when the uh, introduction to our speeches was given that uh, we were actually quoted for unentangling uh, you know, certain aspects in physics. Now, my job is to find out exactly the opposite. We want to entangle. Entangle is a very important notion in quantum mechanics. It means that if you have two systems, you bring them in a coherent superposition, then you can separate them spatially, but they're still entangled. It's like, uh, you know, for experts, the singlet, uh, you can separate one electron to one end of the universe, the other one, the other, they are still entangled. And this entanglement, to maintain this entanglement and to create this entanglement is very crucial. And uh, this here uh, can be done with this uh, coupling of, uh, of uh, this uh, exchange gate leading to an entangled state like this, where you have now a superposition of, uh, of product states which are no longer uh, simple, uh, uh, identical to a product state. And this entanglement to create and maintain is very important. It's also a very interesting question to ask how it comes about that the entanglement comes from the orbital degrees of freedom and you feed it in into the spin sector. And here is a, a model calculation uh, which we did because in the beginning it was not even clear that this is possible. 
Now, this shows when you bring together two quantum dots, you let them overlap. This is the tunneling barrier for a certain amount of time. You come in with a product state, that means one uh, atom has a spin up, the other one has a spin down. Then they start to interact, and then uh, you turn off uh, the coupling after a, a given amount of time, and then you end up with this uh, uh, coherent superposition of the entangled state. And the orbital part has completely disappeared. So first it is used as an enzymatic uh, contribution, but then you end up with this entangled state. It's actually quite nice. And uh, here's the experiment which uh, 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 showed then that this is indeed true. So basically this oscillation, so it's an experiment from the Harvard group, Amir Jacobi and uh, Charlie Marcos many years ago, uh, these oscillations then showed indeed that this entanglement uh, is created and lost and created and lost in a periodic way. And if you stop at the right point, you have the full amount of entanglement available in the system. <coughs> and uh, look also at the speed. That was uh, essentially what we predicted. It's uh, done in 180 picoseconds. That's a very, very fast time. It's faster than a nanosecond, and a nanosecond is about what the clock speed of your computer is. That means it's a gigahertz. It's faster than gigahertz. <coughs> so this entanglement for electron spins is unbeatable. Uh, there is no other system which is so fast. And the reason is because we're using the strongest forces in the material. And this is uh, electric interaction, uh, uh, Coulomb charge, uh, Coulomb interaction, and uh, Pauli exclusion principle. OK, so I think this got turned down. You should, uh, I, I don't know, uh, it was uh, in the transmission process. Turned. I just wanted to show that uh, over the years, uh, uh, many improvements have taken place and it was only last year where the symmetric uh, uh, tuning which we uh, actually proposed in our first uh, paper has been implemented now experimentally and uh, that showed that the phase coherence then in this case is much much longer than uh, the way uh, experimentalists uh, used to do it for 15 years and uh, there were two experiments one in gallium arsenate the other one in silicon uh, germanium quantum dots which uh, showed uh, the same. So also the switching, the type of switching uh, is very important. Now, how can you flip a single spin? So I showed you now how to entangle two spins. And uh, that's another uh, field of uh, spintronics. Uh, the standard one is uh, what is called uh, electron spin resonance, ESR. You apply a static magnetic field, which leads to a splitting of the two levels of spin up and spin down. And then you apply an oscillatory uh, magnetic field which leads to transition. This is used in MRI uh, in uh, all you know, these techniques of uh, magnetic resonances. However, that is a very slow technique. That means uh, you would uh, switch a, a spin from up to down on a scale of megahertz. And uh, that's uh, by far too small or too slow uh, if you want to come up to gigahertz uh, speed. And uh, with electric fields, and exploiting spin orbit interaction, uh, you can do this much faster. You can go into the gigahertz range, and there is an entire list of uh, ways how to do that. And uh, all of them have been implemented experimentally, and it depends a little bit on the material which one uh, is used. So <coughs> here is a, uh, you know, a table for a certain material, uh, still the best one, gallium arsenide uh, quantum dots. And uh, over the years, uh, starting more than 20 years ago, where people had quantum dots uh, with uh, 20 or 100 uh, uh, electrons in there, then around 2000 with a new technique, it was possible to go down then to single electrons uh, in many labs around the globe. And uh, this is probably the most advanced uh, two uh, quantum dot processor where you can do now uh, all the rotations and uh, single spin uh, rotations, but also two qubit uh, uh, C not gate, as I showed before. And the T2 time now, the record time, uh, actually it's even longer than this 300 microseconds. By now it has reached about a millisecond, uh, which is very, very uh, impressive achievement. So here is a, a quick uh, a sketch from uh, Sego Tarucha's uh, 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 two qubit uh, processor in Tokyo. So where the uh, EDSR leads to megahertz switching, and the entanglement here is on the gigahertz uh, range uh, reached. Now, spin qubits, uh, there are many, many variations on the theme over the years which have emerged. So what I mentioned so far is the simplest one. You take a spin, one half of one electron, the up and down, but uh, there are many more choices possible. So I have here even an incomplete list uh, of uh, many uh, contributions. And uh, probably the two most uh, popular ones is spin one half, but you can also do this with a singlet triplet uh, uh, qubit where the uh, zero, the logical zero is a singlet 
then we take two spins which form just one qubit and the triplet state is then a particular one, is the logical one. It has some advantages uh, with the control over this one. Uh, people are still going back and forth between these two contributions. A new one is now uh, whole spins, uh, which has become very popular in, for, uh, since last year or so, because in silicon there was a very important experiment uh, which showed that indeed the predictions which we made more than 10 years ago uh, is a very, very promising one to go for holes and not for electrons. <coughs> Now the uh, development in the field is to go from uh, one or a few to many quantum dots and uh, I just flash here now uh, some experimental achievements where linear arrays of quantum dots, so this is from Charlie Markle's lab now in Copenhagen uh, where he has 12 quantum dots in a row. Uh, there is uh, quadruple quantum dots by the uh, Delft group, uh, Lieben van der Seiden, where you see here the quantum dots uh, being controlled. And uh, the best one uh, currently is the one in Princeton by Jason Petter uh, who controls 12 quantum dots in uh, silicon, silicon germanium heterostructures uh, with a very, very high control. He demonstrated that you can load and unload each quantum dot down to zero and one and uh, control also the exchange interaction uh, between uh, the uh, quantum dots. Now these are linear arrays. Unfortunately, linear arrays uh, cannot lead to a scalable quantum computer. I will come to this now in a second. <coughs> uh, let me see, I have here some more sketches uh, by the by the Sydney group, there's also main player, uh, Andrew Churak and so forth, and uh, they even now uh, think of uh, designing uh, circuits uh, controlled. So spin qubits in gallium arsenate, they have the problems uh, that they are nuclear spins, and that has been a problem which hindered the progress uh, in this field. But uh, recently, uh, new strategies have been uh, developed, especially to look now at materials where nuclear spins can be completely ignored. Either you use holes, Holes interact much less with nuclear spins or you use materials which you can isotopically purify and remove all nuclear spins, which costs a lot of money. Uh, in uh, silicon, for example, this is done now. Uh, there is the so-called Avogadro uh, project where people have, uh, for the measure of, uh, of mass unit, uh, created the kilogram of uh, silicon uh, 29, the one without nuclear spins, and that's now being sold uh, for these uh, purposes in quantum computing. So there are many candidate materials these days uh, and uh, still not completely clear which one is the best but it seems now that the silicon is gaining more and more popularity because this is the material of industry. This is the material of Intel and other companies of chip manufacturers and they have started now to invest into this area because of uh, the possibility to have quantum dots in these materials has been demonstrated uh, now in uh, many labs. So here this is kind of a periodic table which is uh, growing, it is already outdated, it's a year old, uh, where there is a, a collection of different materials with the important uh, uh, key numbers like the T2 time I mentioned before and the switching time and the number of qubits uh, implemented in these systems. So electron versus hole, uh, what is the difference? Uh, Lawrence already showed actually a picture of that, the band structure uh, picture. Typically, uh, we like to be here in the uh, conduction band where the curvature of the band is positive, we have a positive mass. But the valence band is also very interesting. Uh, it has some uh, issues because we have here degeneracy of several levels and then it's not so easy to define a spin. And uh, the uh, contribution from the underlying lattice from the atoms is that here we have mostly p-wave contrib uh, p contributions where here we have s-wave. And that makes a huge difference because p-wave is, uh, uh, is a uh, wave function which has no overlap at the center of the atom, <coughs> whereas s-wave has. And that means here the, uh, spin uh, the uh, hyperfine interaction is much stronger than in this case. So holes from this point of view could be promising and indeed uh, we looked into this many years ago and uh, proposed in some uh, uh, new scheme, basically also by uh, compressing your system and lifting this degeneracy, very similar to what uh, Lawrence was also showing you, and uh, showed then that uh, indeed you get very, very long T1 and T2 times of uh, whole spin qubits. And this was a very, very big surprise because uh, everyone working in the field thought that uh, the whole decoherence uh, must be less than nanoseconds, very, very short but uh, under certain circumstances it reaches the same number as you can get for uh, electron spins. And uh, there are a number of experiments now. Uh, the most spectacular one is a very recent one by my colleague in Basel, Richard Warburton, uh, who showed that uh, indeed the T2 time 
of a uh, whole spin in an indium gallium arsenate self assemble quantum dot can reach times t2 times longer than a microsecond. So this is full of nuclear spins, but the fact that we are dealing here with a whole uh, prolongs the time by a factor of 1,000. <coughs> and uh, there are now uh, a number of uh, labs. I just flashed this now uh, using similar materials where you can use holes and even avoid the nuclear spins like silicon, silicon germanium uh, quantum dots. Again, uh, these are the groups I mentioned before. So they have shown here single uh, spin rotations uh, uh, and uh, controlled phase gates. So that's the two qubit entanglement uh, gate shown in this material, so in silicon. And uh, so here would be a kind of a engineering-like uh, vision how you would control each uh, qubit. And that's uh, one of the challenging now from the engineering point of view to get all the hardware out of your system such that you can control down there uh, the single qubits. So that's a very, very active uh, area of research, uh, how to do this fan out. Uh, and uh, multiplexing, as it is called in the engineering language. One of the uh, uh, spectacular experiments was uh, this recent one by the Grenoble group in uh, France. And what they did uh, really changed the field. They just took a CMOS structure from the shelf. They just went to the, uh, let it to the industry and said, give us uh, you know, some chip which we can play around with, and uh, using a chip as you have in your computer. And they didn't do much. They just rewired, uh, basically, this uh, chip and reinterpreted the system in terms of qubits and spin qubits. And these were whole qubits in here. And uh, lo and behold, it was possible uh, to empty this down to about 10 holes. You don't need a single hole. It's also OK if you have an, an odd number of holes. And uh, showed then uh, a number of uh, very interesting effects, namely the uh, Rabi oscillations, basically showing that you can rotate your spin at a uh, high frequency, reaching almost uh, 100 megahertz. Now they have more than 150 megahertz in the later experiments. And uh, two axis control, which also means you can control this uh, whole qubit. They have not yet demonstrated the two qubit gate, but that's uh, what they're working on. And this was the kind of uh, breakthrough for the industry to see, wow, we don't need to reinvent our uh, uh, fab lines. We can actually use what we already have. And that uh, is sometimes now referred to as a second uh, revolution in the field. Now, how do you scale up? And how much do you need to scale up? And that's a very important question. Uh, it goes now all back to the so-called surface code. That's a special uh, arrangement how to do quantum computation, basically where you have plaquettes. Uh, you can think of each of these uh, squares here containing a spin one half, but they all interact with each other. Uh, so it's a four spin interaction. This can be implemented. And uh, you have these kind of crosses. And the set means the set Pauli and x the x Pauli uh, operation. And in this uh, lattice, which you can extend now, uh, you can implement then uh, logical qubits as large as you want. So out from the physical qubit, you construct logical qubits. And so typically, a logical qubit in that setup contains 50, uh, let's say, 50 physical qubits. It can also have 100, 200, 1,000 uh, physical qubits. And the reason why you need so many is because of uh, error correction. The more hardware you have, the better you can correct the errors uh, in the system. And this uh, surface code has uh, an error threshold that's very important of about 1%. It means that you need to control the physical qubit down to 1%. And this is a great improvement. Uh, uh, 20 years ago, this bound was down by a million was very, very tiny uh, control, very, very high control which was needed. And now we are at the percentage level. And that makes it now feasible uh, that uh, we can actually work in a direction that uh, uh, will one day go into, into uh, real implementation. However, in order to fan out, you would like to have the system a little bit further away. And that uh, leads then to this notion of long distance uh, entanglement coupling maybe on the order of micrometer. And there are a number of physical processes which have been proposed over the years and are being implemented. Maybe the most important one are microwave uh, uh, strip lines, superconducting microwave strip lines, where it's possible uh, to couple on a longer distance uh, also spin qubits with each other. And that's also a very active area. We are about at the threshold that is, uh, is being demonstrated and also floating metallic gates. And uh, just to give you an idea, how big a quantum chip will be based on this technology. 
So if you would like to have a powerful quantum computer chip uh, which can factor a thousand bit number, for example, in the RSA key uh, within 26 hours. And that's a task which would take you the age of the universe to use all uh, supercomputers available. So that's a, uh, uh, you know, this is the ca uh, killer application of a quantum computer, so to speak. And you need in the surface code implementation 10 to 8 spin qubits for this. If you have a uh, lattice size of uh, about one micrometer, so a quantum dot, quantum dot, quantum dot distance of one micrometer, these are thousand uh, nanometers, you can fit 10 to 4 in a centimeter on this side, 10 to 4 in a centimeter on this side, which adds up to 10 to 8. So a square centimeter would make it possible to have such a quantum processor in this technology. Uh, if you compare this, for example, with iron traps or with superconducting devices, an iron trap would probably uh, cover the size of the city of Riyadh because uh, the distance is so big. And uh, with a uh, superconducting device, uh, the size is on the scale of a soccer field. And all at low temperatures. And uh, that's another uh, requirement that I didn't mention too much, but you have to go to low temperatures, sub-Kelvin uh, degrees of freedom. Good. Now, uh, the last topic I, I briefly touch on is that whole spin qubits are interesting because of uh, the uh, strong electrical control you can exert over them. And that's a very, very active area now, uh, just to show you that if you apply, for example, here you have an, uh, uh, an elongated uh, uh, silicon or germanium uh, structure uh, where you have a confinement of a hole in there and you can apply now electric fields perpendicular to this wire. Uh, you get a very, very nice, uh, what we call a Rushba looking like uh, spin orbit interaction, although it's not direct Rushba interaction. And uh, that is the basis of controlling and the spins, and you get very, very strong uh, spin orbit interaction in this system. That's why uh, there are now many experimentalists trying to implement this using such whole spins and putting them into a cavity where you could get uh, fast operations to qubit and uh, at a reduced uh, noise level. So here is a sketch of uh, a truly scalable system. Uh, that's a paper which uh, comes out now in uh, uh, PRL, Physical Review Letters, uh, where it's, it's the first scheme where you can have a uh, scalability in two-dimensional arrays with superconducting devices. But the qubit is now not a superconducting qubit, but this uh, spin qubit that these places here. And we've shown that uh, it uh, satisfies all the needed uh, requirements, at least from a theoretical point of view. Okay, so with this uh, brief outlook, uh, I'm at the end of my talk. Here's my summary. And uh, I just wanted to give you a little bit of a flavor uh, where we uh, are now uh, at the moment. The field is still growing very rapidly. There is a lot of uh, excitement and development. Now, uh, just to uh, anticipate the question very often I get in talks, when do we get the quantum computer? And uh, it's very, very uh, difficult to predict the future, as one man once said, and you cannot even predict your lunch. Uh, so how could I predict the computer? But uh, my prediction would be that uh, maybe within the next 20 years it seems feasible that uh, we will come into this uh, region where it's becoming interesting. Okay, so with this, uh, thank you very much for your attention. <coughs> How this will impact social sciences? Social sciences. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, how much was social sciences uh, influenced by, let's say, the new technology like internet, like uh, iPhone, like computers? And I think it was very much influenced. I mean, we communicate now, uh, much more freely and faster and uh, more globally than we used to do. And uh, this type of technique, I would say, will be the next uh, revolution in this sense. Because our communication can now be done in a much uh, you know, faster and uh, more complex way. So for example, uh, we don't need to uh, you know, have uh, interfaces that I need to be physically here. If we would have uh, enough uh, power to transmit this data, then basically I could have a hologram of me uh, sitting back somewhere in Switzerland, you're sitting here, we talk to each other. But this needs a very, very high power uh, of uh, computing and also transmission. So I think the, uh, as far as I can say, it's very difficult to predict the future, but I would say the social impact I would uh, consider to be very, very big, yes.